battery space. And for those of you not so familiar with what a KXP is, we're a nonprofit organization, arts organization, that has a mission based on the premise that music makes lives better. So we work every day. <laughs> well whooped, by the way. We work every day to figure out how music can play a larger role uh, in your life. And we invite you to come to kxp.org to check us out uh, uh, further. Um, access is important to our mission. And we built this home, this gathering space, plus our studios, to support access. And we made a commitment to the community in working with the, Seattle, uh, the city of Seattle to provide free access to our live performances at no charge for the 30 year duration of our lease. This is a way to discover artists we feel deserve to be heard and we invite you to come back and, uh, and check them out. We started 50 years ago, nearly 1972. And we started a 10 watt station. And one thing that's been key to us is a key value, all good music deserves to be heard. And the way we pursue that is by letting our 45 DJs have the exclusive authority to select the music uh, you hear. Um, we also want to express our appreciation for how the ACLU and KXP formed a partnership back in 2004. And I want to express my appreciation uh, for that. We're really pleased to be bringing the community together and exploring these issues that are oh so important. And for what it's worth, as we talk about sentencing reform tonight, for what it's worth, I spent five years volunteering at Monroe Reformatory and getting the privilege of a courtside seat to how important sentencing is to the prisoners, to their families, and to the rest of us. And I'm tickled that uh, we're talking about that tonight. So as I take a moment here and with a great deal of pride, put on my ACLU scarf. I hope it doesn't clash. On that note, so let me introduce one of the best champions we have, uh, Michelle Storms, the ACLU uh, Executive Director from Washington. Thank you, Tom. We are so grateful to Tom and to KEXP. He mentioned we've been in partnership in various ways since 2004, but this flights and rights endeavor that you know we started, sorry, I'm going to get this arranged properly at some point. This flights and rights endeavor that we started in 2017, we have been happy that KEXP has been our home headquarters for our flights and rights since uh, the early part of 2017. It's an extremely important partnership and we're so grateful to them. So just a big shout out to KEXP. So as Tom told you, my name is Michelle Storms. Um, I'm actually going to be Executive Director of ACLU Washington in one year on March 1st. I'm really excited. Let's just say the past year has been a whirlwind. So um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, to welcome you to our Flights and Rights on Life and Long Sentences. My pronouns are she, her, um, and we have stickers up front if you want to have it for tonight or for other times in your life. Um, you can grab it at the registration desk. So, we are gathered on the occupied territory of the Coast Salish people, and we remember that indigenous people were lied to, treaties were broken, and their land was stolen. We recognize this to honor um, the truth and our commitment to fight for justice for all, for indigenous people, for all people, knowing that acknowledgement is a critical and necessary step toward honoring native communities and having a larger conversation on decolonization and reconciliation. So I start there because that is important. The backdrop of this country, the failure for us to live up to all the things that we say that we are, but the opportunity that's in front of us to live up to all that we say that we are, to native people and to all people, so before we go on to the actual um, program and talking about uh, sentencing and criminal legal system, I want to acknowledge some of the amazing things that have happened since the last time that we have been in front of you. 
So one thing is in the immigration rights arena, which you know has been a particular area of threat ever since this presidential administration began. So together with our friends at the law firm of Keller Rohrbach, we got the government to agree to expedite the processing of refugees who have been waiting in limbo for years due to the Trump administration's racist Muslim ban. So not only will these refugees, many of whom have been separated from their families for years, move to the front of the line, but if they're accepted, it will reduce, they will reduce the number of refugees, they will not reduce the number of refugees accepted this year due to the caps that have been set. This is litigation we've been engaged in since 2017, and we are so proud to have finished it and to have successfully fought for this part, fought against this part of the Muslim ban, and it's gonna result in families being reunited. So thank you for your support. Now, we are also continuing to fight racial profiling by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and Customs and Border Patrol, CBP, in our state and across the country. Now, together with our partners at the Northwest Immigrants' Rights Project, we're suing the government on behalf of Mohammed El Sheikhi, a comedian who was detained by Customs and Border Patrol in Spokane, even though he had proof that he was here legally. Not that anyone should ever be asking you if you have proof that you're here legally. That's not what this country is, and that's not what our laws are, but that's what's happening. So this happened to him, and we've sued on his behalf. And I want to reaffirm that everyone in Washington should be free to travel, regardless of how they look, regardless of who they are. Um, and we're fighting for that right, and for the rights of everyone to live free of racial profiling, harassment, and government overreach. Again, thanks to your support. So there are about 48 of us here in Washington, every uh, staff members of the ACLU of Washington, who are coming to work every day to fight for the rights of all the people who are here, black, brown, white, rich, poor, male, female, transgender, straight, gay, documented, undocumented, every person in this country. And we don't do this alone. We do it because of community partners at various organizations. We do it because of our brave clients who are willing to put their names and their lives and their hearts on the line for justice. Um, and we do it with you to advance freedom for all people. So it is an honor to be here with you. It takes all of us. Um, so now, just a couple more things that I have to mention before we get to the heart of the program. As always, there will be a raffle with fun things to give away. And there will also be a couple of extra opportunities to get some treats. So you just wait and see how that turns out. It's going to be fun. Um, how many are members of the ACLU? Woohoo! love that. Okay, love to have all of you raising your hand when we ask that question because it's cheap, it's easy, and it allows us to tell the courts and the legislatures and anybody else who is subject to our ranting and ravings for justice um, that we have a whole lot of people behind us when we come in and argue. Um, overall, the ACLU has taken 242 legal actions against the Trump administration. <laughs> Immigrant rights, government accountability, transparency, gender equity and reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights, voting rights, racial justice, free speech, using religion to discriminate, all of those issues. We work in the courts, the legislature, and the ballot box, and we're not going to get tired until justice is true for everyone. So now we can get to the program. Okay, we have an extremely important discussion topic this evening. As Tom already alluded to, there are a lot of people in prison um, literally rotting away because that is what our society has chosen to do. I think we're all aware that there's a major mass incarceration problem uh, in this country. I think a lot of you probably can already toss off the statistic that the United States has just under 5% of the world's population and yet houses almost 25% of the world's prisoners. And it's not because there are more criminals in the United States, it's because of our policies and the way we have chosen to address um, issues of crime and criminal justice. Across the country, there's a staggering number of people locked up in jail and prison, and that number has more than quadrupled in the last four decades. In Washington state, the imprisonment rate and total incarceration rate have more than doubled since 1978, despite plummeting crime rates. So our government is locking up people for longer and longer periods of time, 
and we're going to talk about the proliferation of long and life synthesis and what the key drivers are and how that's been happening. Because if we don't reform our laws soon, more people are going to die behind bars who really shouldn't be. Now, we've made a commitment at ACLU of Washington to fight and work very hard toward the reduction in mass incarceration, and particularly to pay attention to a reduction in the racial disproportionality within um, mass incarceration. We know from the writing of folks like people like Michelle Alexander that uh, really what happens with the prison system is a, con is a continuation of racist Jim Crow policies of the past. So we have a lot of work to do. We're gonna have a discussion to dig a lot deeper into our mass incarceration problem. And I wanna tell you, because this is really exciting news, we've just issued a report this week um, authored by two premier scholars, Drs. Catherine Beckett and Heather Evans, that analyze um, years worth of sentencing data and looking at the laws of this state and helping us to understand why there are so many people locked up for so very long in this state. Now, a key collaborator on the report is our own Jamie Hawk, who is the Legal Strategy Director of the, for our Washington State Campaign for Justice. And we're gonna start this conversation with some reflections from her about the report and about the problems facing us as a state. And then from there, I'm going to call in the rest of our panelists for a larger conversation. Um, and of course, as always, we'll have some time for your questions at the end. Okay, so let me tell you about the people you're gonna hear from and then I really will turn it over to them. So Jamie Hawk, who I mentioned, her job at the ACLU is to reduce over-incarceration, not by herself, um, and reform the criminal legal system through legal and policy strategies. A major focus of her work is reforming our state's pretrial detention center system, which keeps people locked up simply because they lock, lack money to pay bail. Her passion for reform was shaped by nearly a decade's work of helping clients through the criminal legal system as a state and federal public defender. She began her legal career working on immigration and civil rights, served with the Senate Judiciary Committee staff of Ted Kennedy, worked on criminal justice at the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts in Washington, D.C., as a legal observer to military tribunal proceedings in Guantanamo Bay, and she serves in the National Council of the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Section and the Washington State Bar Association. A graduate of Gonzaga University School of Law, she's an enthusiastic fan of Zag basketball, and that's no joke because she follows them everywhere, and she loves to travel, not just to Zag games, but all over the world. Okay. So then our panel, um, so Jamie will speak first and then I'll call up the panel. So our panel includes Davida Briscoe. Davida is a survivor network coordinator with Collective Justice where she's building communities of healing and support for crime survivors uh, most commonly affected by violence, including young people of color and elevating those pe uh, people and those voices in policy discussions for public safety and criminal justice transformation. Davida draws on her personal experience as a survivor of multiple forms of violence and her professional experience providing intervention and frontline support for youth of color to reduce gun violence, ensure police accountability, and empower grieving families. She's the founder of the McKinney Project, an organization she started after losing her son to gun violence. She also partnered with the Tacoma Gang Reduction Project to launch Gun Safety, Lock and Unload, a City of Tacoma initiative to help raise awareness and bring safety education to firearm use, and working with Seattle Seahawks coach Pete Carroll's campaign, A Better Seattle. So in February of 2016, her brother, Che Taylor, was killed by Seattle police, and she began working more closely on police reform along with her brother, Andre Taylor, the founder of Not This Time. Uh, she gathered signatures for I-73 and then I-940, which as you know, and thanks to your vote, was a successful um, initiative to enact much stronger police accountability reforms in Washington State, because she was a prime mover. She's done many, many more things, and is a proud graduate of Evergreen State College. And so then our final panelist um, is Nick Allen from Columbia Legal Services. He started at Columbia Legal Services as part of a prestigious Equal Justice Works Fellowship having a two-year project focused on addressing legal financial obligations, the fees, fines, and restitutions imposed by the court as part of criminal judgment and sentence. LFOs, as these debts were called, often interfere with a former um, incarcerated person's ability to re-enter society. 
Now he's the Deputy Director of Advocacy at Columbia Legal Services, a statewide nonprofit legal aid organization that does systemic advocacy on behalf of people primarily in prisons and jails and those returning from those institutions. He's a 1999 graduate of the University of Notre Dame and was motivated by his inter interest in social justice to seek a law degree. And prior to law degree, worked for King County, former King County, County Council member Larry Gossett. So this is a very esteemed group of people who have deep personal and professional experience with this work, and you're gonna learn a lot from them. Um, so I'm gonna get started by having Jamie come up and share about the report we just issued, and then after her overview, we'll bring up the panel. So please welcome Jamie. Good evening, everyone. It, um, this is an awesome crowd, and thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. It's really, really great to have all of you here. And we really are looking forward to this discussion tonight about extreme sentencing and mass incarceration in Washington State. Uh, Michelle told you a little bit about our, our campaign for smart justice and our, our broader work at the ACLU of Washington to really dig into legal and policy strategies to dismantle mass incarceration uh, in all its forms in our state, to really reduce the jail and prison populations and go after eliminating uh, the rampant racial disparities that we know exist in the system. And long and life sentences are the main cause of mass incarceration in Washington, and so we're gonna dive in and talk about that um, tonight. Uh, Michelle highlighted a little bit, just to set the stage, um, extreme sentences and our related laws and practices are keeping people locked behind bars far longer than ever before. The result is that more people are spending more of their lives in prison than at any point in the history of this country. These sentences are not effective deterrents and they destroy people's chance at rehabilitation, reunification with family, and reintegration into society. With convictions disproportionately affecting people living in poverty and people of color, these sentences are also exacerbating the extreme racial disparities uh, in the criminal legal system and continue to tear vulnerable communities apart. So, also, as, as Michelle mentioned, we're very, very excited um, to share with you, after um, over two years of work and, and collaboration, um, just today, literally a few hours ago, um, we released uh, a new report called About Time, How Long and Life Sentences Fuel Mass Incarceration in Washington State. It dives into 30 years of sentencing data here in Washington, and we're very grateful for the expertise and collaboration of Dr. Catherine Beckett and Dr. Heather Evans, um, both at UW. And um, you may be familiar with those names um, and their work in a, in a case called State v. Gregory. Does anybody know what um, happened, what, what the state Supreme Court did in State v. Gregory? It has to do with the death penalty. And this, this is a trivia question. And if you get it right, you get a people, a people Not Prisons t-shirt. Or a tote, you can have your selection. Any guesses? What did the court do in State v. Gregory related to the death penalty just in the last year and a half? Yes. Exactly, you got it. You got, you got two sizes and a tote, so you can pick your option. Yes, that's right. So based on the, the excellent data analysis by Dr. Beckett and Dr. Evans, which found that African Americans are four times more likely to be sentenced to death in our state, uh, our Supreme Court 9-0 held that the death penalty is unconstitutional as applied. And uh, just yesterday, uh, for the, so, so the third year in a row, our state Senate has passed a bill to repeal the death penalty and yesterday, in front of the House Public Safety Committee, the bill was heard, and so we're waiting to see uh, if that bill is gonna move and it's gonna get to the floor of the House this year. Um, and our state will, for once, 
once and for all, after all of these many years of hard work and advocacy, um, officially um, take it off the books, even though the court has already ruled that it's unconstitutional. So, uh, so, so very excited uh, just to set the stage a little bit and share. I just wanted to share a couple highlights um, with you about our report. So this is the cover. I think we've got some some copies back there, but it's available on our website. So you can go and there's two links and versions. There's a full report that's actually 120 pages and an executive summary that's a little more um, summarized and, and digestible that you hopefully can read um, a little bit faster. So um, a couple of the things that uh, this report and, and digging into this 30 years of data um, has found and, um, and, and we're excited to see how this can really mobilize and, and move forward the conversations already underway with many of our allies and partners around the need for sentencing reform in Washington. But um, the data, as we dove in related to this report, to really identify what are those main drivers that are contributing to these increasingly long and life sentences in Washington? What is the story of mass incarceration here? What's, what's happening um, in Washington? So we, we really, um, the professors do an amazing job of really digging in and, and laying that out and really telling the story of sort of tough on crime policies and politics and how, you know, over the last four decades really, and we sort of document um, and tell that story of how sentences continue to get longer and sentences are growing and growing. And we now have an aging prison population um, and we have a very high number of folks um, who will die um, if we don't have meaningful reform. And so we're going to dive in and talk a little bit more about that. But so um, the, the numbers of people serving life and long sentences um, have continued to, to dramatically increase. Um, the other thing we wanted to really dig into with the data is to look at the age. How young are people when they're first convicted? Um, and, and Nick is going to um, talk about some of his incredible work um, around adolescent brain science and some of the litigation and some case victories that we've had here in Washington State that he's been an integral um, part of. But approximately um, a third of the people sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison in recent decades were 25 or younger at the time that they were sentenced. So they were in that 18 to 25 um, uh, population and so these are just a few of, of the slides that you'll see if you if you look at the in the executive summary just really showing um, increasing rates of j a jail and prison total incarceration in Washington and again the number of we kind of broke it down between long um, 10 to 20 years very long 20 to 40 years and life um, and de facto life which is 40 and up um, in the state of Washington and as you can see, these trends um, of sentences just getting longer and longer, the length of time that we're warehousing people in our state prisons. And you know, as Michelle indicated, we've, we've had uh, a significant drop in violent crime, um, yet sentences are continuing to grow. So another thing in the report that we highlight, we really wanted to share um, stories of transformation. And one of the things that was um, most meaningful to me about working on this project with Drs. Beckett and Evan as we, Evans is we really wanted to center the voices of those currently serving long and life sentences because nobody knows more about the reforms that are needed in the system than the people um, in prison right now serving those um, sort of draconian and barbarically long sentences. And so at, um, and it sounds like, you know, like Tom volunteered with DOC and so grateful um, for his his work, um, and as he mentioned in the opening remarks, but there are opportunities to volunteer in our prisons, and there's some pretty incredible organizations. A couple that I work most closely with are CLO, the Concerned Lifers Organization, and BPC, the Black Prisoners Caucus, and they have um, annual summits and conferences that they put on each year, which is really incredible. And um, you can, if you're interested and really wanted to attend, please see me after and we can chat a little bit more about that. So we collaborated with CLO and BPC on this report and um, they, it was incredible to, um, 
they're very active already. They have a legislative committee they, they track on TVW, kind of what's what's going on in the legislature, and we're, we're already currently collaborating on, on legislative reform um, in Washington. So we feature uh, a few stories um, of transformation of people serving life and long sentences in Washington. So you can go um, and see those. And then just, um, you know, as, as those charts showed you, and we're gonna talk about more tonight, but the, and Michelle highlighted as well, but the number of people um, sentenced to a prison term of 10 to 20 years has more than tripled in the last 30 years. The number of people with a sentence of 20 or more years has nearly quintupled. And um, one in six of all state prisoners are over the age of 50 now, and many serving long and life sentences. So um, those are just a few, few of the highlights um, that we wanted to, to touch on, just kind of help set the stage for tonight's discussion. And then um, now we're gonna take about um, five to six minutes, hopefully that's okay, but really wanted to lift up and center the work of um, our, many of our uh, important um, allies in this work, the is Disability Rights Washington, DRW. They do incredible work inside the prisons and they created this video and so we're gonna watch it now. Sentences who currently have no hope of release. Instead, these people spend decades in prison at massive cost to their families, their communities, and the state. Coyote Ridge Correctional Facility in Washington State. A group of inmates moves down a walkway, several in wheelchairs, another uses a walker. Next, a professor from the University of Washington, Catherine Beckett, PhD. My name is Catherine Beckett. I study criminal law and punishment. Between 1993 and 2013, the number of prisoners age 55 or older increased by over 400%. DOC reports that one in six prisoners is 50 years old or older. One of the best predictors of declining recidivism rates is age. People who are 50 years or older, in the vast majority of cases, pose very little, little risk to public safety. People simply age out of crime. The criminologists have been talking about this for decades. An inmate using a walker. Next, an older prisoner with gray hair is interviewed. My name is Bill, Bill Joyce. Uh, how old are you? Is it really a part of our American moral system to keep somebody in prison who is not a threat? Is it part of our, of our culture to say we don't care what you have done to change inside? We're not going to change what we do. A group of inmates meet in Monroe Correctional Facility. By 2030, one third of the adults incarcerated in state and federal prisons will be over 55 years old. So for Washington State, that would mean that we would have over 6,000 people uh, in our state prisons that were over the age of 55. The prison is not set up for this. This isn't what they signed on to do. They don't want to be an old folks home. Washington's incarceration rate is now double what it used to be. And there are actually only four countries in the world that have higher incarceration rates than Washington State. Our prison system is currently operating over capacity, and we're one of just a handful of states that has a, a rising prison population since 2011, despite continually falling crime rates. One of the main drivers of the climbing incarceration rate has been the imposition of more and more long and life sentences. So in 1984, the Sentencing Reform Act was, was enacted in Washington State, and um, that legislation did not call for increased sentence length, but what it did do is abolish parole for most prisoners. So under the older system, most prisoners would have had a chance to go before the parole board and um, demonstrate that they were rehabilitated and had matured and were safe to release. But after 1984, that opportunity was taken away for most prisoners. And that's one of the main reasons we have more older people behind bars in the state. Uh, Devin Adams? Well, I've been in prison for 19 years. I understand that punishment is important you know, in, in our criminal justice system, but how much is enough? Okay, my name is Eugene Youngblood. 
I'm uh, 45 years old. How many years have you been in prison? Uh, 27 years. When did your expectation? Uh, 2049, beyond the expect my life expectancy. Society doesn't want people here just doing time, right? Um, society would like for people to be here learning, uh, growing, becoming better people, right? Mature, understanding where they went wrong so that they can correct their behavior. And so I don't think that society would like for people just to sit here and grow old. My name is Anthony Wright. I've been in prison since 2001. What purpose is being served by someone sitting in here graying in prison? What, what is the purpose of it? You know, and you will see that it's, you peel back the layers, it's strictly retribution. It's strictly retaliatory. Like, you did this, okay, we're gonna just throw you away. You're just a, you know, a lost life. And that should not be, it should be reevaluated to show the worth. I, you, you're, you're rarely gonna find a human that doesn't have worth. An inmate waits for medication at a secured window. So for a couple of different reasons, experts believe that incarcerating older people is a pretty poor use of taxpayer dollars. It costs about twice as much to incarcerate an older adult than a younger adult. And the main reason for that is the, the cost associated with providing the medical services that people need in their older years. It's also true that people age more rapidly in the prison context, um, and so those medical needs tend to set in at an earlier age than they would if people were living on the outside. An older inmate slowly lowers himself into a wheelchair. My name is Walter Cooper. Here. So this is available online if you want to keep watching. Uh, Sorry to, old, to, to cut it short, but we just really wanted to show you the faces and voices of some of the men that helped work on this report with us. And uh, so at this point, let's get started with the panel. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, in a minute, I'll have some this happening. Um, I already introduced our panelists, so I'm going to have a seat. Oh, here we go. I hear me now. Um, I'm going to have a seat and just sort of have us get in this conversation. Um, I know that what Jamie's just shared with you is pretty sobering, and um, and this is a sobering situation. So I'm going to draw on the expertise of the folks here to help us figure out what we're going to do about it. So I'm going to start with you, Nick. Um, so you're an attorney at Columbia Legal Services, which we've already talked about. You've been working on the civil side of addressing these issues of mass incarceration. And I know you haven't read the report yet, um, but you've heard from Jamie just now. And I'm just wondering what stands out for you about this report and how that relates to what it is that you guys have been doing at Columbia Legal Services. Um, well, a, co a couple of things uh, stand out for me. The first thing is kind of a, a you know, big picture thought is that Washington is definitely not off the hook when it comes to uh, mass incarceration. We're a player uh, in this, uh, and I think what was described by Jamie uh, makes that uh, pretty clear. The second thing associated with that is that, you know, clearly we have a flawed sentencing system. Um, and I don't think, you know, that was ever the intent when it was put into place, when the SRA was put into place uh, going on 40 years ago. Um, but at this point, uh, there's clearly some significant flaws in um, that system and how it operates. Um, and also, I think it goes to, you know, with amendments that have been made to the SRA, with initiatives such as uh, three strikes that have been uh, passed in Washington State. Uh, it's also uh, evident that there was no forethought about what the long-term impacts of those uh, policy changes would have on our uh, state prison system in our communities that are affected by it. Um, as, as far as 
uh, what could be done to address uh, some of these problems. Um, I mean, at its most basic level, the goal of ending mass incarceration is to get uh, more people out of uh, out of prisons, out of jails, and um, right now there's no safety valve uh, that's in place with uh, the determinant system. Uh, there's folks that you know if they're sentenced to 70 or 80 years in prison, they're going to serve the, the 70 or 80 years in prison, um, and probably much shorter than that because they're gonna uh, they're gonna pass away while they're there. And so the the other thing that comes to mind is the efforts that have been. Uh, uh, thought through over the past several years about how can we um, uh, make it so that that is no longer the case. And I know a lot of communities have been working on um, safety valve efforts through uh, post-conviction uh, review um, uh, reform efforts that have been proposed over the last what, probably five or six years. There's been uh, at least three bills that have been introduced before our state legislature that doesn't return us to a parole system, uh, uh, keeps the determinate sentence in place, but allows people the opportunity to petition for early release um, after you know, 15, 20 years or so. Um, and I'm not endorsing any particular um, model. I'm not, in, I'm not saying that this is better than a return to parole or a complete reform of our uh, SRA, but it is ways to um, ensure that uh, everybody who's serving those sentences uh, does not end up uh, dying in uh, dying in prison or serving sentences that are that are much much longer uh, than they should have been um, been serving. Thank you so much. So, Davida, if I could turn my attention to you, and you've been working with Collective Justice, and I'll ask you to explain more about that a little bit later. But in this moment, I'm just curious about any reactions that you also have to this information that I know you're very well familiar with that Jamie has shared? Um, I mean, I first have to, like, yeah, I have to elevate that I am a person who suffered serious harm. Um, I lost my son to gun violence, and I'm connected to a community that have lost, also lost children, and who we are elevating um, and who we're using to push these policies are not the people who are most victimized. Um, they are the black and brown poor children who are from uh, disenfranchised communities. Um, they're not being elevated when these policy decisions are being made. Although these communities are the ones that are being over-policed and they're the ones who are driving um, mass incarceration, uh, their needs and, and the trauma and some of the, the poverty and the things that are in those communities are not being addressed. Um, so when we're pushing these policies, nine times out of 10, you know, your three strikes laws, all your laws are pushed in the name of the deserving victims, um, you know, or the innocent victims, your victims from suburban communities or upper middle class, um, you know, Marcy's law and Sarah's law, you know, they're not little Marquise's law. Um, and so, I mean, when you think about it, it, <laughs> it isn't. And, um, and so I, I think I can just, I can only speak to that issue. I can only speak to the issue of if you are a child who comes from a poor community, black and brown, and your death is related to gun vi uh, gang violence, um, you know, you're nameless and faceless. And, uh, you know, th there is no policy that's tied to, to that. So um, I can only like really speak to who we're elevating in these policy, policy decisions who we are saying are the victims, and then who we are, and who's left out of those policy decisions. And most of the time, the victims are, who are most likely to be robbed or shot or assaulted are, are not lifted up as victims, but they are portrayed in mass media and everywhere as the criminals, um, or as the people that we should fear, or the people that, that, sh that are disposable, um, that are irredeemable, um, and that could be easily replaced. And so that narrative, I think, is what needs to shift, and that's what I can speak to. Well, first of all, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you lifting that up in that way, because that's exactly right. And one of the things that you'll see when you read the report is how many of the folks who are incarcerated were themselves victims of violent crime before they got into the situation where they were participating in crime in some way. 
And when you read these stories and hear um, sometimes just how uh, a, a bad moment and a synchronicity of bad events all came together to get folks incarcerated and knowing that it started for so many of them at 15, 16, 17 years old, it just, it's just almost too much to bear, really. Um, Jamie, can you say some things about uh, what drove the commissioning of this report? What, did, what is it that you're hoping to accomplish with this? I think that's on. Yeah, thanks so much. So, you know, as, as we've all discussed tonight, we know that to really tackle mass incarceration in our prison population, that we need some bold, broader, comprehensive sentencing reform. And we really have to take a hard look at our system and uh, and what its goals are, and um, is it retribution? Is rehabilitation a part of that? Um, do we want to continue this path of warehousing people and um, sentencing, you know, having them serve longer and longer terms of imprisonment? Um, and who, who does that serve, right? And, um, and what is you know, public safety? And you know, as Evita has mentioned, like public safety for who, right? <laughs> What does that mean um, when we talk about public safety? Um, and so this report, I mean, our hope is that by having this uh, comprehensive study with 30 years of data, that we're really able to help identify some data-driven policy recommendations. And I hope, hopefully, to have, to change the laws in this area, to have sentencing reform, that means the state legislature. Like, there are some, litigation paths here that you know Nick can talk about and that at the ACLU we try to help support in all the ways we can through amicus briefs um, to, to change the law in some ways and get cases up to our state Supreme Court but really the way the law is now and the way the sentencing system is structured the only way to really reform it is, is through the legislature and so the hope is that by having this data and some data-driven policy recommendations that we can really um, continue to help build this movement and push towards uh, more meaningful and comprehensive reform in the legislature. Thank you, um, and that's exactly right. So that gives me a chance to come to Nick because you serve on the Legislative Sentencing Task Force, and I'm wondering about the work of that body, if you think that's a body that can help us move in the direction of making the change that we need to see happen, just what's going on there with the task force that you can share with us? Yeah, sure. So the uh, criminal sentencing uh, task force was created um, as part of last year's budget. It was included. And it's a um, uh, broad-based group of stakeholders that are around the table talking about uh, sentencing reform um, in a you know pretty comprehensive way, talking about what reforms uh, could be made to the uh, uh, to the SRA, starting off really I think with more uh, low hanging fruit um, uh, recommendations. I know this year in the legislature there's a couple of bills that are floating out there um, that uh, look at uh, reforms to community custody, so folks who are on supervision. Um, there's a 20, House Bill 2393, which would allow for, basically allow for good time on uh, 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 community custody. There is uh, Senate Bill 6370, which allows for uh, presumption of concurrent supervision uh, uh, for terms of community custody rather than consecutive. And then there's also some uh, uh, proposals that are out there that weren't um, there, where there wasn't consensus by the group, but nevertheless, proposals were put forth before the legislature. So um, uh, I don't want to get too technical here, but like there's a bill out there that amends the swift and certain policy for people who um, uh, uh, violate while on community custody. Um, and I also know that you know out of one of the discussions uh, around legal financial obligations, which is a, a you know part of sentencing, that there was a bill um, to. Uh, address restitution uh, in situations where it was owed to uh, to insurance companies. Um, as, as far as um, where I think that's going, I mean, I think that there is the uh, potential for uh, successful um, recommendations to come out of the sentencing task force. Um, but as I've explained, 
you know, even my discussions with the task force, I think that there's a t couple of things that need to be taken into account um, when we're doing this work. And one, I think, is being absolutely intentional about our work to uh, uh, come in to end uh, racial disparities. Um, it's something that often becomes a byproduct of the discussion around sentencing reform. And then 20 years, 30 years later, we say, oh, great work was done. Oh, but those racial disparities remain in place. And it's because nobody is talking about these up front. Um, and an example that I like to, uh, like to give uh, as a, a, an analogy is what has happened here in King County with, uh, uh, with youth detention. Back in the early 2000s, the average daily population at the youth detention center was about 200. Um, and good work was done uh, to reduce that down today to about an average daily population of 42. But they weren't intentional when they were talking about uh, race and racial disparities at the outset with the uh, uh, daily population of, of uh, the youth jail. And guess what? The, that, uh, that's played out. The disparities are there and even worse about uh, uh, they, on the King County's website, they have uh, information that says of the 42 kids that are now in um, youth detention, 37 of them are kids of color. Half are uh, uh, black kids. And so if we're not intentional up front about uh, addressing sentencing reform, understanding that racial disparities are a strong driver of where we are today, um, then we are not going to be successful in reforming the sentencing system. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, what this report will also show you is that the folks with the longest sentences are black, brown, and native people who, despite the um, small numbers, uh, generally speaking, relative to the population, are incarcerated at higher numbers. And that flows from the policing that happens in those communities that is um, much more extreme than in white communities and so on. So um, we see this playing out. So the idea that the only way to solve the problem is to confront it directly and to speak directly about what it is that's happening is, I think, spot on. David, I was hoping you could tell us about collective justice and what that is and what that work is about and how that might impact this issue. Yeah, I hope I can uh, do some justice to uh, what we actually do. Um, I was hired as a survivor network coordinator. Um, Martina Cartman uh, is the founder of the organization. She's a Soros fellow and started a restorative justice program up in Monroe, uh, which is like a 52 week um, curriculum, I guess you could say, putting men who have caused serious harm on a path to healing and accountability. Um, so in our collective, uh, we are uh, people who are impacted by interpersonal and state harm. And we are trying to address both mass incarceration and violence at the same time. Um, and, uh, and also building up resources and skill to towards wellness and accountability and collective liberation. Uh, yeah, my work is with victims in that the community. sounds pretty good, actually. <laughs> okay. I was gonna say, okay, if you want me to go on, I can go on. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was uh, uh, brought to the work, of course, through the work that I've done with Not This Time, my brother Andre Taylor pushing Initiative 940 um, after the death of my brother, um, who was killed by two police officers. And um, we did a lot of reform work there, and um, so brought some of my organizing work to collective justice, and also elevating the voices of marginalized victims in the community, again, whose voices are left out of policy. And our model is more of like a heal to advocacy model, um, where we are also centering the needs um, and voices of people who are most impacted but whose voices are left out of those policy decisions. And bringing those men who have committed serious harm um, in community with the people that, a surrogate panel of survivors, and story t deep storytelling, uh, healing, and uh, sharing. And so it's been probably one of the most transformational things I've ever witnessed um, in my time, is just people incarcerated having survivors to humanize them is been something they have not expected um and was we had to prep them for like months for it because they kept asking a bunch of questions like well what are they going to say and what are they going to how are they going to look at us and what are, they just had a ton of questions mm -hmm. um 
but bringing them in there together has just been uh, pretty powerful and transformational. That's great. I actually want to stay with you for a moment to have you talk a little bit about um, what accountability might look like if it's not long sentences. And then I'm going to circle back to Jamie and Nick to talk about the role of legislators. Because I think from the work you've been doing, you've been thinking a lot about other crime survivors, about families, about the people who have committed the crimes. And that is a big question that people have. Well, what is, you know, we have to hold people accountable. So I'm just wondering about some of your thoughts on that. Um, well, our, the idea is that um, accountability is punishment and that accountability is making someone else suffer um, or it's retribution. Um, but within all of us, we all have this idea of right and wrong and that if there is harm done, that something must be done. Um, and uh, for me, um, I can only like speak directly for me because I can't like, I, I think this is the other hard thing is that people want to speak for all victims. <laughs> you know, we're, we're all complex. We all have different stories. We all have uh, all different cases. Um, and for me, the young man who shot my son, of course, was only 17 and he did not intend to shoot my son. And the prosecutor pretty much just left me out of the whole uh, process uh, because they didn't believe that I was going to help him with his with a conviction and so I was actually going to ask the judge to give him a lower end of the sentence range and because of that um, they just left me out of the whole process um, what I would have wanted as far as accountability I felt that yes he should go to prison but I didn't feel that he should get the higher end of the sentence range and he should spend 26 years of his life in prison at the age of 17 um, and the fact that he had trauma and came from a poor family didn't lessen my pain any it didn't lessen my pain, um, but at the same time, I would have felt like, what would have helped this kid from the beginning <laughs> not to get into this situation in the first place? And could some of that money that we're using to incarcerate him go back into the community for the community to respond and to help this kid? So, uh, you know, so when I think about accountability, I. I think about this young man having this sentence imposed upon him and him not having the opportunity to engage in a process of accountability, of self-accountability first. And, and people go to prison and just sit and do time. And we know that. <laughs> um, and they can sit in prison for 20 years and not engage in any process of accountability. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I, I just believe that imposing something on somebody and making them or trying to hold them accountable is not accountability. And what the criminal justice system does is it makes, it makes defendants do one or two things. It makes them deny the crime completely, what their attorney will tell them, or it makes them feel like they're a complete monster and they shame spiral, which is also not accountability. So you either, you're doing one of these two things in the criminal justice system. You're either believing you're a monster and that you don't deserve to be free, or you're saying you didn't do it. And for victims, I don't want either one of those things. Because if you're saying you're a monster, then now I gotta take care of you. And if you're denying it, I don't get the truth. So to me, neither one of those is accountability. What I want as a, as a victim is I wanna know the truth. I wanna know that you did this. I don't want you to de deny it or blame me for what you did. I want you to admit what you did. I want you to show some genuine remorse and responsibility for what you did. And then I wanna, want the harm to be repaired. How that happens is, can be a gamut of things depending on the nature of the crime. But at the same time, what our criminal justice system does is pays this adversarial role and causes the person who caused the harm to never take accountability. And so, and so that's, I think that's where restorative justice steps in and um, putting people on a path to accountability and helping to repair and making things right. So you are amazing. encourage all of us to sit with two things that just got said. One, that she as a person who had experienced this crime was left out of the conversation because she didn't want the highest possible sentence. Like she basically got left out. And that is so disturbing. That is so disturbing. Um, but also just the idea of what accountability actually is. Because incarcerating people doesn't 
make them accountable. Accountable. You know, I've had the opportunity also to work with a number of people who are incarcerated in Monroe, and there's quite a number of people who've really made tremendous strides to, as, as some of the fellows said in the video, confront what they've done, think about it, and try to make amends. Written letters to people, uh, taking courses, and really try to learn and grow. So I'm just wondering, now turning back to Jamie and Nick, what do we need to do to get across to, to legislators and to systems to listen to the voices of the people who have lived these harms and to engage in true reform? Either one of you can go first. <laughs> Well, I mean, to your question about what what is the role of legislators and what do we need from them, one word, courage. <laughs> and political will to change and to recognize that what we've been doing for the last four decades isn't working, right? And that this this place of mass incarceration that we're in now um, is, is not effective. Um, and we can do better, and we can build uh, a system that um, incorporates much of what DeVito was just saying, and rethinking accountability and punishment, and what does rehabilitation really look like, and how can we invest in, in the system um, to in, in reform it in, in those ways. So. I think that there remains, you know, this again, this tough on crime era. Even though the the movement for broader criminal legal reform has been building, and with all of your support and having all of you involved and changing, helping us change this narrative and talking to your neighbors, reaching out to your lawmakers, just the way we think about crime and punishment and what what's appropriate and what what justice is and looks like. Um, we all together have to change that. It's going to take all of us. And because our legislators have such power and are in these critical leadership roles and have to take votes on many of the legal and policy changes that, that Nick and I want to bring before them, starting in 2021 and big, bold, broad sentencing reform type changes, um, it's, it's going to take all of us. So um, yeah, I'll stop there and turn it over to Nick. You know, I echo everything that's been said here. I mean, um, I think that there's a little bit of a, of a tension that's going on, uh, particularly around uh, criminal justice reform efforts, where there is um, kind of going towards the light with evidence-based um, practices, but also being conditioned and holding on to old myths um, that don't work. Um, you know, I, I've seen this in bills where I'll say, wow, the legislature has really done some really, has imposed a really forward looking policy around sentencing. And then uh, look a little uh, further down in the bill and there'll be something like a gang enhancement or a firearm enhancement. Um, and so I think there's always, there, there's still some tension in it. We're not, we haven't quite gotten over that, uh, over that threshold. Um, I, completely agree and don't have much uh, to add to what's already been said by Davida and Jamie with regards to, um, you know, listening to communities. Um, I, I think that the most uh, successful and impactful legislation that has been passed over, um, you know, the past several years, uh, or, at least, or even the best, uh, legislation, best legislation that's been introduced has been that legislation that's come from um, uh, communities that have built coalitions and uh, put together uh, solutions um, to problems that exist out there. It hasn't been, you know, a room full of lawyers that's coming up with a few changes, changing some words in the law and saying this is going to be uh, what's best for the people that are impacted. Um, so I think that um, as far as uh, legislators um, uh, uh, grasping that, but also um, the advocates as well being willing to take a step back uh, and realize that, you know, we might not be uh, best positioned to uh, put forth these changes, that there really are experts out there um, that oftentimes aren't given the time of day, but when they are given the, uh, the time of day, a real meaningful change actually um, occurs. 
Thank you. So let me just ask a couple more questions of you all before um, I turn it over and give the audience an opportunity. Um, Jamie, one of the recommendations in the report related to post-conviction review, and I'd love for you to talk about what the situation is currently with that and what that might mean if that were to change. So please raise your hand if um, you think we have parole in Washington State. A little bit of a trick question, but um, we don't actually, right? And many people are shocked to learn that there is no parole here. And so part of the devastation about these increasingly long in life sentences, you know, as they talked about the safety valve, like there really isn't one. How it works now is there's a pardons and clemency board and it's a very political process. You can present your case and they make a, they vote and they make a recommendation to Governor Inslee about whether clemency should be granted. And Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe 10 people, like five to 10, maybe 12 at a, in, a, in a given year get clemency. And how many people do we have in prison right now in Washington State? Oh, that was gonna be my other trivia. If anybody gets it, you get a t-shirt or a tote. Anybody know? What's your question? How, how many people are incarcerated combined in all of our state prisons? She got it, 19,000, yeah. So, yeah, you need a t-shirt or tote later. So just actually a little bit more than um, just above 19,000. Um, so post-conviction review, and, and Nick please weigh in, but there, he t touched on a couple of bills um, that would address this lack of safety valve, this reality that we throw people away in prisons to serve 60, either a life without parole or a, a sentence as a result of um, so many enhancements being stacked on um, that they're looking well beyond their life expectancy, right? And we'll never get out. And so if there's no system in place to really show how you've been rehabilitated, to really give people hope, right? It's really about hope and giving people a chance. Um, and I think about like so many of the men in the videos and, and there's other, another really amazing thing that happened and if we had a little bit more time, we were gonna show up another clip of um, some of the men um, incarcerated for the first time last le year during the legislative session. They were able to testify um, to the Senate, and it was so powerful. And that's another thing, you know, related to our lawmakers um, that they need to do. They need to go inside the prisons. They need to meet with people who are currently incarcerated. They need to go to the CLO and the BPC uh, summits and um, or, or the meetings um, every week. They have a legislative committee meeting, and our lawmakers need to go and learn and connect with people who who are incarcerated. And, um, but the post-conviction review uh, would, would set up, and so we have a parole coalition and many of our, our organizations are all working together with many, many others to try to um, identify the best path forward and what, what that looks like. So I think increasing, moving forward, there's gonna be several proposals, but, but one that, has, that we've done a bit of work on was Senate Bill 5819, which would, after 15 years, which is a long time, 15 years in prison, you'd have at least a chance to go before the, this post-conviction review or some similar body that was set up um, to, to tell your story and show what you've been doing with your life over the last 15 years. And, and let this and, and have a, a more diverse body of people who have been impacted by the criminal legal system, apply a racial equity lens, make sure that we have a much more diverse group of individuals deciding who, who gets released and, and when and how. So that's the general yeah. concept. Thank you for sharing that. And, and I should say, in asking about that, it's not that I think that's the solution, right? I mean, I'm glad those bills are there and we need that. Um, I'm right there with you about sweeping reform, though, right? That's only one small piece of it. Nick, I was wondering if you could just tie uh, a little bit of this to some of the issues related to juvenile sentencing, because we've talked about some of the people who get sentenced and they're teenagers, and they get, but they're getting sentenced as adults. Um, you've been doing a lot of work related to juvenile sentencing and just how does that fit into this as well? Uh, yeah, it fits in um, uh, pretty closely. So we have a, uh, that safety valve in place, that model in place um, for 
youth that were under the age of 18 at the time of their offense. So this all goes back to um, uh, U.S. Supreme Court decisions in the past uh, like 12 years or so where the courts have ended uh, life without parole for juveniles, uh, 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 excuse me, death penalty for juveniles, uh, life without parole for non-homicide offenses, uh, mandatory life without parole. And on that last point, when uh, the court decided in Miller versus Alabama that <clears throat> mandatory life without parole sentences were unconstitutional, um, our aggravated uh, murder statute became unconstitutional for um, uh, people who were under 18 at the time of the offense. And so the Miller Fix Law was passed here in Washington State back in, I want to say like 2014. And what it required is that uh, all uh, juveniles who were serving a sentence of life without parole, a mandatory sentence of life without parole at the time, had to go back and be resentenced and a new scheme was put in place. Uh, that is, uh, it is a, a parole scheme. A minimum term is put in place. The individual gets review at the end of the minimum term. Um, and uh, um, there's a uh, presumption of release, so they shall be released unless it's more likely than not that they will commit new criminal law violations. Now, as part of that, there was also a provision added uh, for youth that, were, that did not commit uh, aggravated murder. So we have a law right now that says if you were under 18 at the time of your offense and you have an aggregate sentence of 20 or more years, uh, at 20 years, you can petition the Indeterminate uh, Sentence Review Board, the parole board here in Washington State, uh, for relief, for early release. And again, that presumptive language is in there as well. So you are uh, presumed to be released, you shall be released, unless, uh, again, the court finds that it's more likely than not that you'll commit uh, new criminal law violations um, if released. And um, dozens of individuals have been released under this provision. Um, the sky is not uh, fallen. Um, it's been a, a, a positive reform effort for, um, uh, for folks who committed crimes as, uh, as youth in Washington State. And I think uh, where it ties in is now a lot of the um, language of this model is being considered um, uh, as a, a policy proposal to be applied to um, uh, adults as well. So, um, so I think the, 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 the juvenile reforms here in Washington State have kind of um, set a good example of what is possible uh, when dealing with, uh, with long sentences. Thank you, Nick. So what I'd like to do now is um, there might be questions that you all have. And if you do, it would be most helpful if you could come to the mic. Um, if you're not able to come to the mic for some reason, we can try to help you out. But um, what I'll do, if there's a lot of questions, I'll just gather a few, I see your hand up, uh, gather a few questions and then I'll, I'll write them down and then we'll just sort of answer them as a batch. It looks like there's gonna be a lot of them. So um, just come up and ask your question and thank you so much. Uh, oh. 